We're now going to talk about what it means for a sequence of random variables to be bounded in probability. This is a pretty subtle but quite important topic and idea. And while this stems from thinking about sequences of deterministic variables and what it means for those sequences to be bounded, it turns out when we move from thinking of bounded sequences of deterministic variables to sequences of stochastic variables that are bounded in the correct sense, things become a little bit more complicated. Before jumping into the definition for a sequence to be bounded in probability, let's think a little bit about single random variables. There's a really important fact that we are going to use to motivate the definition of bounded in probability, and that is for any single random variable z that takes values in the reals, um, we have this limiting statement. As we consider value c larger and larger, the probability that our random variable z exceeds c in absolute value necessarily converges to zero. And this is just a way of saying no matter how wide that distribution of, of z, eventually we can choose a c so big such that there's only a tiny amount of mass outside of it, and that tiny amount gets small as, as c increases. So let's visually remind ourselves what is going on with this statement and look at an example. In this example, we're going to look at a normal random variable with mean 0 and variance 1. So here we see a random variable with mean 0 variance 1. We're looking at its density. We could imagine plugging in 0.5 for c. What's the probability that z in absolute value exceeds 0.5? And we see in that blue shaded region, there's actually a lot of probability that z will exceed that. We can now maybe consider a c further out, c of 1.5. Here we see that there's now a much smaller probability that z exceeds that in absolute value, but still an appreciable amount of probability there. Again, we can move further out, think about c equals 2.5. We see this probability again drops. We can move further out, finally to c of 3.5, and we see there's only a minute amount of probability outside of, of 3.5. And again, as we imagine moving further and further out, that probability will get closer and closer to zero. One thing to note is that probability is never equal to exactly zero. Um, a normal random variable, no matter its mean and no matter its standard deviation or variance, always has some positive probability of being arbitrarily large. So again, here we're just saying that for any random variable, that probability goes to zero, converges to zero as the tail that we are considering gets further and further out. So now we're going to look at our definition for a sequence to be bounded in probability. So a sequence of random variables, here I'm going to denote it by z, or z1, z2, up to zn, etc., is said to be bounded in probability if this limiting statement we have here holds. And if we look at this statement, it actually looks very similar to that result that we had before, that the extremal probability, the probability that a single random variable exceeds c in absolute value goes to zero as c gets large. Um, for a sequence to be called bounded in probability, we need that to happen in a uniform way, right? In particular, as we look at any given c, we now consider the maximum or the supremum of the probabilities that any random variable in our collection or sequence exceeds c, and we need that to go to zero as c goes to infinity. So this is a little bit of a subtle statement, but intuitively what it's saying is that there can't be any appreciable probability mass that shoots off to infinity as we look further and further in our sequence. That all of that probability mass has to be well bounded it doesn't necessarily need to look like it's concentrating on zero, but it needs to be well-bounded. It needs to not shoot off to the extremes. Let's consider an illustrative example of a sequence that is bounded in probability. So let's look at a sequence of Gaussian random variables, all with variance 1, however with a mean that changes in n. The mean of the random variable xn is going to be the sine of n over 3. And as n increases, this is going to fluctuate back and forth between 1 and negative 1, right? It will never exceed 1, um, and it will never get more negative than negative 1. So if we think about this visually, we'll see in a second, it may be relatively clear that this sequence is well contained, that we don't have mass shooting off to, to plus minus infinity. And we're going to think about why this sequence is bounded in probability. So let's look at the sequence. The first element is going to be normally distributed 
with variance one and this mean sine one over three. So we see that the mean is slightly to the right of zero. We can look at the next element, the third element, etc., and we see that the, the spread of this random variable um, remains the same. It's just the center that moves. And as we move through, we see that it's, again, periodically going to be oscillating between one and negative one. Again, in this case, the variance is always one and the mean is bounded between negative one and one. So the amount of extremal mass, the amount of mass in the far tails is not growing out of control. Each of these random variables does have some probability of being arbitrarily large, but that probability is not growing or not growing much as we change indices in that sequence, right? Sometimes it grows a little bit, sometimes it shrinks a little bit, depending on whether the mean is increasing or decreasing, but the mean doesn't shoot off to infinity, right? The mean is well controlled between negative one and one. So intuitively, maybe we can see that this sequence is bounded in probability, and maybe another illustration will be helpful. So here I have these blue dotted lines at plus and minus eight, and we can imagine, you know, this is plugging in eight as C, we can imagine trying to think about how much probability is there that any of our xi are greater than eight. And as we think about, you know, cycling through elements of our sequence, we see that for all of those elements, there's only a tiny amount of probability mass that is either greater than eight or less than negative eight. And that again is well controlled, even as we imagine incrementing indices in our sequence, looking further and further in our sequence, that doesn't grow. In contrast now, let's consider a sequence that's not bounded in probability to help us better understand that definition of bounded in probability. So now let's imagine a sequence of Gaussian random variables whose mean is always zero, but whose standard deviation grows. Here, the variance of the nth random variable in our sequence, yn, will be n. So again, the variance is growing as we traverse our sequence. And we're going to visually look at these and and again, try to understand for ourselves why this would betray our notion of bounded in probability. So here we have y1 is normal with mean zero and variance one. y2, normal mean zero variance two. As we continue through our sequence, the mean stays the same, the variance increases, right? Up to maybe the 10th element in the sequence, the 30th element, right? And, and what we see, so the spread of these um, distribution seems to widen, seems to get larger. Um, and what does that mean? If we look at, say, the value 10, y30 and even y10, but really y30 seems to have some appreciable probability of being greater than 10 or, say, less than negative 10, where if we go earlier, we note that y1 has essentially no probability. It's not quite zero, but it's incredibly small of being greater than 10 or less than negative 10. So again, now we have mass that does appear to be shooting off to infinity, right? More and more extremal probability as we go deeper and deeper into our sequence. And so that's why this violates that definition of bounded in probability. So again, as the width of this random variable yn increases, mass is getting pushed out to plus and minus infinity. And in an intuitive way, this makes it feel like our sequence is unbounded. And so our definition should reflect that. And more formally, if we wanted to engage with a mathematical definition, for any C, no matter how large, if we consider indices of our sequence large enough, eventually their standard deviations, the square root of the index, will be quite large, will be as big or bigger than C. And at that point, we're going to have appreciable mass from that random variable, appreciable probability that that random variable is greater than C in absolute value. So that's how one would show that this example is not bounded in probability. Let's return for a moment to our formal definition of bounded in, in probability and try to understand why we are using this definition as opposed to maybe a simpler definition. Let's consider a candidate simpler definition and see why that simpler definition would not do the things that we need our definition of bounded, our working definition of bounded to do. We're going to define a different type of bounded. Um, this is going to be bounded with probability one and understand why this is not an ideal definition to engage with when we're thinking about asymptotic statistics.
So here, given a sequence z1, z2, etc., we will call it bounded with probability 1 if there is some value c, some real number bound, such that none of the random variables in our sequence exceed c with positive probability, such that with probability 1, each element in our sequence is less than or equal to c. So this seems like a very um, direct extension from a bounded deterministic sequence to a bounded probabilistic sequence. It feels much simpler than our previous definition of um, being bounded in probability. Again, bounded in probability, very different we'll see than bounded with probability one. Why can't we just use bounded with probability one? Why, why can't we focus on that when we're engaging with bounded stochastic sequences? We're gonna talk about a quite simple illustrative example that will show us why we might wanna focus on the definition bounded in probability rather than the definition bounded with probability one. Um, so in this example, we're gonna have a sequence of random variables. Each one is gonna be Gaussian with mean zero and variance one. So we're basically independently replicating the same random variable over and over again. And intuitively, this sequence feels bounded um, and it will be important when we study asymptotic statistics further that this sequence satisfy whatever our definition of bounded is. So let's look at the sequence. Is it bounded with probability one? Is there some bound that we can identify, some value C, such that the probability that all of our random variables are greater than C is exactly equal to zero? And in this case, the answer is no. We know that for a Gaussian random variable, there is some positive, though very small, probability that it is arbitrarily large, right? And we saw that in, in the figures at the very beginning of this lecture. So no, the sequence is not bounded with probability one. However, the sequence is bounded in probability. In fact, any sequence that has essentially the same random variable or a random variable with a fixed distribution replicated independently over and over again will be bounded in probability. So we know we can't use that um, bounded with probability one as our working definition for a stochastic sequence being bounded. Instead, we need to use bounded in probability. Um, however, Maybe there's some way we can marry the two. Maybe there's some way we can use the intuition from bounded with probability one to help us think about what it means for a sequence to be bounded in probability. So we're gonna do this and we're gonna give one intermediate definition that will connect those two. So again, a sequence Z1, Z2, etc., is bounded with probability one um, when there's some fixed number C such that um, with probability zero, do any of our random variables exceed C? We're now going to define this new um, type of bounded. We'll say bounded with probability one minus epsilon, where epsilon can be any number greater than zero that we specify. So it could be bounded with probability 0.9 if epsilon is 0.1, bounded with probability 0.99 if epsilon is 0.01, and we will say a sequence is bounded with probability one minus epsilon for a specified epsilon, if there is some c epsilon, some c that will be a function of epsilon greater than zero such that none of our random variables exceed c in absolute value with probability greater than epsilon. So again, this is saying our random variables actually can exceed this c or c sub epsilon with some probability, but it has to be really small. It has to be at most probability epsilon or equivalently, our random variables are less than or equal to C epsilon in absolute value with probability greater than one minus epsilon. So this is a softening of saying that a sequence is bounded with probability one. It's again, it's slightly less stringent saying that the sequence is bounded with probability one minus epsilon. In fact, saying that a sequence is bounded in probability is equivalent to saying that it's bounded with probability one minus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. So again, if you're given a sequence that's bounded in probability for any epsilon that you could choose, one could show that it's bounded with probability at least one minus epsilon. And if you wanted to show that a sequence was bounded in probability, then you would have to show that for any epsilon, no matter how arbitrarily small it is, uh, 
that that sequence is bounded with probability 1 minus epsilon, according to this definition. One can think of this as saying that bounded in probability is the smallest weakening we can possibly have of bounded with probability 1, right? It's not quite bounded with probability 1, it's bounded with probability 1 minus epsilon no matter how small that epsilon is.